we just heard from some grown-ups in the room. And at the same time, GOP Congressman Troy Nels, he's already said he's going to oppose any immigration bill because he does not want Joe Biden to get a win. OK, the border is a huge problem. OK, add to that down in Texas. They're stopping U.S. Border Patrol agents. The state of Texas is from doing their job because, again, they don't want to solve this. Not on Biden's watch. Is this not proof that this is all just a political stunt? Yeah, well, listen, the win needs to be for the American people and for those people on the border. There is a bipartisan solution to be had here now. And people have want both Democrats and Republicans have wanted this on the border states and, you know, mayors and senators and governors, whether it's in Arizona or Texas, you know, New Mexico. And you've had people like Lindsey Graham and Senator Lankford of Oklahoma, uh, you know, working hard on this, Senator Tillis, you know, very conservative senators working on this. And they're getting the best deal they can right now. And why it would be foolish to reject it right now is, first of all, it is needed right now. It is a crisis right now. You can't be waiting nine months. But if they wait, there's no guarantee that Republicans are going to have the House next year. You know, uh, we have a there's a very precarious majority right now. And with redistricting and with a lot of problem seats right now, there's no guarantee. I mean, when the prognosticators look at it, it's a real 50-50 jump ball. Secondly, you know, Donald Trump, who may be convicted, you know, I don't think he's going to be, re, you know, be elected. But if he's convicted, we know about 58 percent of Americans, you know, and a lot of Republicans are not going to vote for him. So this is the best deal that Republicans could get in years. Plus, it's going to come along with the much needed aid that many Republicans and obviously Democrats want for Israel and much needed aid for Ukraine. So. This deal on the border is what a lot of Democrats don't want, but this is the best we can get in years. And there's a lot of Republicans in the House want it. Patrick McHenry, conservative you know, Republican who was, you know, the you know, speaker for a month there in October, has said, take the win and stop listening to these loudest, foolish, you know, House Freedom Caucus guys, you know, just because they scream and shout, do what's right for your caucus. And if you want to have a House Republican majority, take this win. All right, Connor, what Barbara is guilty of right now is being rational, rational, reasonable, <laughs> practical. But I want you to actually be cynical. It might not be right. It is not right. But is it a strategic political move, right? People on both sides of the aisle will agree that the border crisis is a huge problem. But at the end of the day, most people blame the person in the White House. And while the problem rages on, it's Joe Biden's problem. That's right. So I guess you could call it political for that reason, that he's responding to something that people out there in the country are demanding of him, and he feels like he needs a win to be able to stand for re-election. But I, I just think the, the big difference cannot be stated enough, which is that Joe Biden actually has an interest in solving a complex policy problem for the benefit of the people affected, you know, maybe for his own political benefit. But I think he's proven that he does care about the people that live in these towns that are shouldering the burden, the mayors of these big cities that are spending all of their money trying to take care of the influx of immigrants and clearly the immigrants themselves. Donald Trump's life is not going to change one bit, whether three million people come across the border or one million or five million and whether a, a bill ever gets passed. He to him, these issues are just clubs to try to beat his opponents with. That's more than clear at this point. And that's why he's going to tell the Republicans to be against it. And I think one of the one of the really under noticed aspects of the Biden presidency is that he keeps legislating with full Democratic votes and then small slices of Republicans like he just did on this spending bill. And if he can find a way to make that happen on immigration as well, it's going to be a major accomplishment whether he gets credit for it or not. No, what I'm asking is, can any of these Republicans who are voting against it do it with a straight face? Is there any reason besides we just want chaos and to help Donald Trump because while the border is a problem, it looks bad for Biden. Isn't that their only reason for doing this? Most likely. I mean, it would depend what was in the final compromise. Look, I mean, I'm not afraid to say that there are Republican arguments for border security that are strong and empirical mm -hmm. um, and have been better than some of the ones put forward by Democrats. So you could see someone saying, look, this doesn't do enough with technology. This doesn't... Uh, 
you know, impose enough of a, a burden, there's going to be 3 million people next year under this bill. You could make policy arguments, but that's clearly not what they're going to do if the first day that Donald Trump says vote against it, they're all rushing to say that they're against it. Barbara, you know centrist Republicans. Do you think Democrats could persuade more centrist Republicans to break away and support a border deal? Well, listen, if you're one of those swing Republicans that, you know, is fighting, you know, to come back, you know, you're in a Biden, you know, a seat that Biden won, or, you know, you're in one of those tough districts and you're rejecting this, you know, you are putting yourself in, in jeopardy. But more importantly, the speaker is putting his majority in jeopardy. So, you know, yes, he's in a tough spot. He has these people, you know, from the Freedom Caucus who are threatening his, you know, his speaker role. But if he wants to be speaker and bring back that majority, he has to listen to Patrick McHenry, a very wise conservative, and say, stop listening to these loudest voices and do what's right for the majority of your caucus. But more importantly, you know, good policy is always good politics. And the good policy, what's good for the country, is to get this solution that will be supported. You know, you have very conservative senators over there who have worked this out, put this together, and then, you know, for goodness sake, you know, conservatives, you know, who care about Israel, who care about Ukraine, who care about the border, you can go home and sell this, regardless of what Donald Trump is going to say or what the Freedom Caucus is going to say, and have the courage of your convictions and, and go out there and go back to your districts and sell it. It will be the right thing to do. Do not be afraid of these, you know, a Bob Good from, you know, the Freedom Caucus guy from Virginia who actually is already being opposed in a primary uh, because he was supporting Ron DeSantis and not Donald Trump. So don't be afraid of him, for goodness sake. <laughs> Our approach is a fundamental break from trickle-down economics, supercharged by my predecessor. My predecessors like to say, America is a failing nation. In my faith, bless me, Father, for his sin. I mean, come on. <laughs> We're doing pretty damn well economically and getting better. He wants to see the stock market crash. You know why? He doesn't want to be the next Herbert Hoover. As I told him, he's already Hoover. The president made a campaign stop in Raleigh, North Carolina, to celebrate the state of the economy under his administration. And today, we got more positive news. People filing for unemployment for the first time fell to the lowest level since 2022, and wages continue to rise faster than inflation. And in December, this is the number that I want to pay attention to. Retail sales rose more than expected. Now, many Americans say they're unhappy with the economy, but they are out their spending. Joining me now, my dear friend David Gura, business correspondent for NPR. And I want to start right there on retail sales. I often say that Amazon data is way more important than Facebook data because Facebook is what you say you like and Amazon is what you actually do, what you purchase. So all this noise that people are like, everything's too expensive. I'm out. I hate this economy. Well, that doesn't square with people out there shopping, shopping and buying. They're out there and they're buying things. I think that's important. There was this shift to services that was happening for a while. People were going buying dinner and trips and all that. Now they're going back to buying stuff. physical objects, stuff at the stores. Um, I'm from North Carolina. I was cheered to see the president in my home state. And I think that the tack that he took is interesting, which is he began by talking about something the administration's doing, bringing broadband to North Carolina. And then that was kind of an entry point to get into trying to compel that audience and the broader audience in this country to look at the whole picture. Retail sales is a part of that, but he wants to convey that if you look at all of the data together, this economy is doing pretty darn well. He moves from there to sort of take credit for that, point out the distinction between him and, as he said, his predecessor. He still won't say Donald Trump or President Trump, but he's, he's getting closer to drawing that distinction and reminding people of sort of where we came from. Even in talking about broadband, the point that he made in that speech was, you know or you must know people who during the pandemic had to go to a McDonald's and sit in the parking lot to get Wi-Fi so that your kids could go to school remotely. I think that that exercise of reminding people how far we've come is something that he's going to have to drill down on more here as the, as the and, campaign And continues. while that's happening, all week we heard CEO after CEO at the World Economic Forum in Davos talk about the fact that the economy is improving, that the Fed will likely cut rates this year, which will be a huge win for everyone. But we're also seeing a boom in new businesses starting. Why do you think that is? 
But that doesn't often happen when rates are high. No, and that's a, a crucial data point, again, when you look at the entire picture. But it shows that people are, yes, optimistic about the economy, but confident about where it's going as well. And there, there is this kind of arcane disconnect that we're seeing now between what Wall Street thinks the Fed's going to do and what the Fed, in fact, is going to do. And you hear Fed officials coming out and saying, we are going to cut rates. It might not happen as fast as you think they're going to. But again, directionally, we're, we're going in the right. We're going in the right direction. And you mentioned retail sales. Another kind of crucial number that we got today had to do with mortgages. And we saw the average rate on the 30-year fixed rate mortgage down to the lowest it's been since since May. So again, the progress we're seeing here is is notably positive. And I think the president's right hit on that. But when it comes to the economy, we do hear from Trump supporters, we had it better when we had it better when Trump was in office. We heard it this week from people in Iowa. What exactly are they talking about? What can they point to that was so much better? Well, he talked a lot about it when he was in office. And I think there is that steady drumbeat makes people <laughs> think that it was great. That was true. And then like he, he very skillfully ignores the pandemic, which was this huge thing. He thinks it's anomalous. Of course, it was an aberration, but an important one. And in the degree to which Biden does acknowledge that, Trump is very keen to okay, ignore the fact that it happened. Okay, but isn't that so funny? Because he used to say all the time, look at your 401k, you're welcome. And Joe Biden never says that. And somehow people haven't realized, oh, wait a minute, my 401k is bigger, is better now. But it was tr Trump repeating it over and over, you're welcome, stock market. And people somehow believe it. Can't they just look at their statements? They should. Again, I think it's kind of incumbent on the president to keep hitting this. I think that's what we saw in Raleigh today is an effort to keep doing that. I think that's going to happen more and more. Uh, but, you know, we've talked an awful lot about sort of like, is, is the stock market the best barometer to look at the economy again? Look at the whole picture. It's one part of the fact that I think things are doing really well. Listen, the, the stock market and the economy are not the Discrete same Discrete objects. Yes. However, a stock, the stock market doing well is a net positive for a whole lot of people that have any sort of investment. Um, I do want to share something else that we heard from Donald Trump. He now says that he is going to put in place protections to stop banks and regulators from trying to, quote, debank you from your political beliefs. Can you explain what in the world that even means, debank you from your political beliefs? I can explain it. You know, there, there have been very far right wing activists who have had financial companies say that they're not going to do business with them anymore. But this is the thing that the former president is floating as though it's something that's happening to people across the board, that banks are saying, we don't want to do business with you because of your politics. This is we're talking about an aberration here. That is not happening widely. And you see this come up when bank CEOs come and testify before Congress. Some lawmakers bring this up. It's not happening. And I'll give credit to Philip Bump from The Washington Post. who wrote a great piece about this today, which is. Everything that Trump introduces or says, immediately uh, things go catastrophic and worse immediately. And that's sort of what happened here. If you, if you watch the moment from that speech in New Hampshire, uh, he brings this up. It's kind of incomprehensible. And he goes to look at what they're doing to our country. Again, I will emphasize debanking, removing somebody from being able to use a bank or financial institution service is happening to an infinitesimal amount of people. But he's making it seem like it's something that's widespread. I'm out of time. But then is the reason... You hear from some bank CEOs, some big financiers. Well, I'm still considering Trump knowing the chaos that it would bring, knowing that he's somebody they wouldn't do business with and they wouldn't hire. Is it all because they know Trump won't regulate them or he'll cut regulations and likely he'll cut taxes? I think, of course, that's the case. And, you know, going back to the World Economic Forum, a number of those bank CEOs spoke to people on the sidelines of that. And I was disheartened to hear how blasé they were about the choice that Americans are going to face. I didn't expect anybody to endorse President Biden or the former President Trump. Um, but they seem to be very complacent about what's going to happen. And the stakes, of course, in an election are huge. I, I thought more than would acknowledge that in those interviews. We have the most special segment for you right now with a message, never count out Michael Cleveland. Michael Cleveland was born blind and mostly deaf, but despite those extraordinary odds, he became a master fiddler. And now he is back with another Grammy nomination. My friend and colleague Sam Brock celebrated his incredible journey to stardom last year. Watch this. To hear Michael Cleveland play the fiddle, is to experience bluegrass packed with passion and fury, the melodies of a lifelong love affair. It feels like bluegrass is in your bones. It's all I've ever really wanted to do, and 
uh, something that I was born into. My grandparents were big fans of bluegrass music. Michael was born blind and doesn't have hearing in 80% of his left ear and a quarter of his right. Despite his challenges, Michael's grandparents took him to shows all over his hometown of Henryville, Indiana, starting at six months old, and by three or four, he was hooked to their eight-track player. I would take one of those speakers and lay it flat on the ground and lay my right ear on that speaker and go to sleep listening to, to bluegrass. Behind the brilliance of this prodigy, a fearlessness to learn. Find a good jam session that I can get into. Now, we placed a 400-person crowds from Phoenix to Fort Myers. Oh, man, it's just a pure adrenaline rush. Boosted by a family who only wanted to share his dreams. Do you think if your grandparents today saw this? I don't think they would be surprised. They'd be darn proud. I hope so. I am absolutely honored and thrilled to welcome Grammy Award winning fiddler Michael Cleveland. He is nominated again this year for Best Bluegrass Album and tomorrow night he will play here in New York City. He will be performing with the one and only bluegrass artist, but you know him as a comedian, Steve Martin. <laughs> and David Gura is still here. You guys all know he himself is a fiddler. He is the one who introduced us to the music of Michael Cleveland. And I asked David if he wanted to bring his instrument but he was just intimidated no, <laughs> because the master is here. But I wanted you to be here because I know yes, you're a super thank fan. You. Thank you. Michael, this is extraordinary. Tell us how you feel about this nomination. Did you ever think you would be making it to the Grammy stage? Oh, man. It's just uh, more than I could have ever dreamed of. And this category, man, everybody in the category, it's just such a great uh I mean, all the nominees, and it's just such an honor to be nominated. What comes next for you? Oh, uh, well, uh, we're going to uh, play here tomorrow, and then uh, next weekend I hit uh, the road with Bale Fleck. Well, actually, we hit the air, <laughs> and we go to Europe, and we play for a few weeks. So uh, look forward to that. David, I have absolutely no questions for you. Would you like to ask one of your musical heroes anything? I did um, bring the fiddle. We were playing in the green room, and Michael, um, I think something that I love so much about this music is that there's this common repertoire. You play bluegrass, and I play old time, which came before bluegrass, but, you know, uh, I picked up my fiddle. You picked up yours, and we played Soldier's Joy. And I, yeah. I wonder if you could just talk about the, the world, the community that this has introduced you to, because I just love having that kind of card to play that, you know, th there is this repertoire, there, there are these songs that we all know and can play, and it's such a wonderful way just to kind of meet somebody and get to know them. Absolutely. You know, I've been in jam sessions with people uh, from different countries that, you know, didn't really speak any English. I play on sessions all the time for, for people, you know, that, uh, that don't speak English or whatever, but music is this common thing, you know, if you know the tunes, or you know the musical language, it just brings so many people together. It's so cool. What is your message to the world, Michael? Uh, my message to the world? Uh, boy, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm, what? Your message is your music. Exactly. I love to play music, and uh, anybody who cares to listen, man, I'm, I'm just thrilled to death. Well, would you like to play us off the air tonight? All right, we'll play something. <laughs> well, be my guest, Michael Cleveland. Thank you.